This is chapter nine. When we're talking about chapter nine, the only other things that I would say may show up, okay, are going to be, of course, how do they get their funding? So the first idea was pick a strategy, either international trade or self-sufficiency. How do they get their funding? Okay, you can either have a transnational corporation. Okay, a transnational corporation um, that may actually come in and invest directly. We call this FDI or, okay, um, sometimes they call it direct foreign investment. Okay. FDI, okay, foreign direct, okay, I like to call it direct foreign investment because it makes sense. Okay, the foreign companies are actually going to invest directly into the takeoff industry. This would be like L'Oreal coming in and pointing out, okay, hey, you have argon oil, okay, that's something that we really want. We're going to go ahead and pay for your roads, we're going to pay for the port, we're going to pay for the processing plant, okay, in order to get that started. Um, and therefore, okay, they are going to end up making money. Okay, the, com uh, the country itself is going to actually probably benefit from that transnational corporation. If you do not have a transnational corporation that comes in and okay, sort of starts this process, you have two options. World Bank and <clears throat> IMF. Okay, World Bank and IMF. Okay, IMF stands for International Monetary Fund. So, of these two, okay, they're going to provide your country with money. Usually, World Bank is going to provide money particularly for infrastructure, okay, so that you can build roads. The idea is if you can build roads, if you can put in electricity, water, all of those good things, then an MDC transnational corporation would see, hey, I don't have to pay for all of that there. Okay, this is much more convenient for me to come in and put one of my businesses or takeoff industries there. Okay, unfortunately, sometimes they'll build all of this infrastructure and then no transnational corporation shows up, which means that they end up owing a lot of money. So now, before actually giving out funding, they give uh, and they make you actually sign something called a structural adjustment program. Okay. This is basically a plan that the borrowing company uh borrowing country or I'll use the word state since that's okay, politically correct. Okay, it's a plan that the borrowing state makes okay, to basically show how they'll pay back money. Okay. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. The World Bank okay, is actually going to be comprised of many, many, many different countries. And so, therefore, if those countries' banks are giving money to an LDC and the LDC doesn't develop, it's like okay, putting, pretty much like putting all of your okay, money in one stock and then watching it drop. And it, you're never going to get your money back. Okay. So, instead of just giving out money and hoping that it will do well, they give out money and then the people who actually are taking the money and trying to develop with it sign this plan that says, look, if it doesn't work, here's how we're going to pay you back. And unfortunately, a lot of times it means we're going to have to take money from our social programs. So probably from feeding our people, maybe taking care of education, taking care of okay, women and children, hospital okay, stuff like that. Basically, uh, we're going to have to drain our financial resources in order to pay back. But the World Bank a lot of times says we will not give you money until you sign one of these. Okay, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, similar situation, okay, giving out grants or funding um, in hopes that they will develop. There's one more option. Fair trade. Okay, fair trade is usually small. They are not corporate which means that usually local people own them, sometimes even families. Okay, 
the money will go to pay fair wages. Um, not only fair wages, but uh, like improvements in uh, maybe the education, improvements in the infrastructure, giving out loans to their workers so they can improve the uh, they can improve the area. Fair trade is going to be taking the product and selling it directly to the consumer. You are not going to actually use retailers. You're not going to use a huge transnational corporation. So, for example, um, Caribou Coffee. Hey, this morning while I was in there, they have fair trade coffee which means that that coffee does not go through a distributor. That means that that coffee is made in, okay, we'll say, for example, I don't know, Colombia, okay? If it's made in Colombia on a fair trade farm, that means that the majority of the money, okay, is not going through someone else to get back to them. Instead, the money, the money is actually going right back to that farm. Okay, they're able to provide their people with fair wages. Okay, they're able to provide them with, um, you know, safety, protection, okay, all of those types of things, um, you know, paid maternity leave, et cetera. Um, at the same time, I get the guarantee that I'm, okay, not really, um, I guess, abusing, okay, a cheap laborer, but I also get the guarantee that there's no chemicals or pesticides, okay, used on um, whatever it is. Okay, so those are kind of in demand right now, along with that whole organic thing. Examples of fair trade. Okay, coffee is a good, a good example. Chocolate is a good example. So that. Yeah, Altered State. Oh, my gosh. Altered State, you guys know what I'm talking about over in Zona Rosa? Fair trade all over that place, okay? If you buy things there, um, the money is going directly back to say, the people who are making it, which is pretty cool, okay? Um, the only other things for Chapter 9, okay, consider the dependency theories, the idea that potentially we will never actually have LDCs develop because we've kept them in a state of total backwardness. Okay, some good ones to look back at are uh, Andre Gunder Frank, Angry German. Okay, he says he says that development somewhere means under development somewhere else. Okay, and that you cannot actually have everybody develop. Okay, kind of, you know, doom and gloom, okay, but also maybe a little realistic. Another example would be Emmanuel Wallerstein and the World System Theory. Okay, World System Theory, of course, core, semi periphery, periphery, the core is going to always exploit the periphery and the semi-periphery and purposely keep them in a state of backwardness because again it kind of links back in with the dependency theory is the idea that okay um if everybody develops you're creating your own competition which is a terrible horrible way of looking at it okay but a lot of times that's true all right um <clears throat> the only other thing was geographic path dependency which is a totally different idea And I'm going to just go ahead and call that agglomeration because now you know what agglomeration is. An agglomeration okay, and geographic path dependency model <clears throat> is the idea that once an area specializes in a specific industry, whether it's basic or not, okay, they are going to probably continue that for, a, for really the rest of the time. Um, it is unlikely that anybody will actually be able to compete with them. So best example, uh, Nashville, okay, and country music, okay. <clears throat> it's going to be an agglomeration because everybody in the country music industry is going to locate there. Um, sure, they may be in competition, but they are not in competition locally. They're in competition, okay, in terms of basic industry and bringing money in. Um, but they are going to benefit from shared laborers, okay, shared costs, um, okay, specialization of people in that industry are all going to locate there. People, talent agents are actually going to be there. So if you're a singer, you're going to go there. Um, the other example is Silicon Valley. <clears throat> okay, um, and that's going to be computer technology. Okay. 
Um, again, okay, that area is known for, okay, really now, decades of computer technology. Okay, banks are willing to fund um, new startup programs and, and maybe even some experimental okay, types of things there. Silicon chips okay, were made there, which are computer chips. Uh, if people graduate from MIT okay, and they want to go directly into information technology, they're going to go there. They know they'll find a job. At the same time, the Silicon Valley companies benefit because they're going to get all the best workers without having to go look for them. That's a really, really good example of agglomeration. As long as okay, deglomeration doesn't occur, okay, this is going to continue pretty much forever. Okay? Deglomeration is going to be when usually one, so say for example, Silicon Valley has like uh, four main computer companies. If one goes out, okay, a lot of times that means that now you have a fourth of the computer workers that are out of business or out, you know, they don't have a job. They're not spending money in the economy, which means now everybody has one fourth of or three quarters of the consumers that they used to have. Detroit was the example where it just kind of continuous down, okay? All right, um, we have 10 minutes and we're going to knock out uh, chapter 10, okay? Yeah, 10 in 10 minutes. It's going to be amazing. I mean, if you want to stay till 10, you can. <laughs> hmm? I if people are still here. Sure. Okay. Agriculture, primary industry. Okay, we know um, that if we're talking about uh, ancient, ancient, ancient agriculture, we have vegetative planting, okay, and then we have seed agriculture. Okay, if we talk about vegetative planting, okay, that's actually where you're taking like a little piece of the plant, okay, you're putting it down in the ground, okay, and then uh, it's actually going to reproduce, okay, basically by that cloning procedure. Um, sometimes we call this cutting, okay, and, and that's what we still do today. Um, where's it going to start? I heard someone. Asia. Okay, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. Seed agriculture is also uh, going to develop at the same time as the domestication of animals. No. Okay. Um, and that domestication of animals, seed agriculture is going to start where? The Asia, Southwest Asia. Think Mesopotamia. Okay. Fertile Crescent. Mesopotamia, you're good. Okay. All right. Um, seed agriculture also, okay, is going to be found in China. You could also find it in Ethiopia. Okay. Um, Mexico. So we're thinking Aztecs. Okay. Maybe even Inca and in, okay northern Peru. So just an FYI. All right. So let's talk about the main divisions: subsistence. Okay, versus commercial. All right, so subsistence agriculture, the main purpose is survival, yeah. Okay, your purpose is one thing that is going to okay, basically be different between the two. For subsistence, okay, it's going to be survival. Feeding yourself and your family commercial is going to be for sale. Um, the second thing is going to be the percentage of farmers in the country. If it's subsistence, it's going to be what percentage? A very high, if not all. Okay, and then in MDCs it would be what? Very low. Remember, okay, less than 2% okay, in the U.S. and Canada. Okay, next one, technology. 